And we're back. Look at this. It's Pascal time. The This is a quote. This is a quote from Blaise Pascal. The art of subversion, of revolution, is to dislodge established customs by probing down to their origins in order to show how they lack authority and justice. End quote. And they act like Derrida invented deconstruction in the 20th century. I mean, come on. This episode is kind of about Pascal, but really, it's about his mind. And we're going to access his mind by way of his writing. It has become very common, all too common, for academics to get so bogged down in biographical and historical context almost always as a way of sneaking in their own political ideological hobby horses, that they end up neglecting what seems like it ought to be the central matter of discussion, namely the text itself. This process of historicizing literature until it is deeply situated, or whatever they call it, they often like to attribute to Foucault's influence, by the way, you'll, you'll like to know, and so, if they do set out to read someone like Pascal, these academics, they spend most of their time asking what sort of a society he lived in. We do live in a society, guys. And then they get into all the details, which side of the political questions he was on. How did he treat women? What was the class status of his parents? How was he educated? Did he drink water to hydrate or beer? How might the bishops have pressured him to think? What hallmark legal changes featured prominently in his middle years? And so on and so on. And you can read, seriously, 20 to 25 page papers on any single one of these topics for almost any well-known writer. What they all neglect is, of course, the author's own thinking. His will itself, his mind, his soul, right? I mean, yes, of course, everyone's mind is shaped to some degree by their historical period, you know, the one into which they were born. But some thinkers tend to sort of detach from their own epoch, and they attach themselves instead to eternal matters. A quick example. Although she did not date the poems herself, which basically proves the point, many of Emily Dickinson's best poems were written, close as we can tell, during the Civil War. Now, the historicizing reader will therefore be looking for poems about war and slavery and race and constitutional matters, but Dickinson's poems very often feel as if they could have been written during wartime or peacetime, and during any century, nay, any millennium, in the past 5,000 years. Here's a typical example. Listen. A thought went up my mind today that I have had before, but did not finish some way back. I could not fix the year, nor where it went, nor why it came, the second time to me, nor definitely what it was have I the art to say. But somewhere in my soul, I know, I've met the thing before. It just reminded me, t'was all, and came my way no more. To read this poem, to really understand it, does not require an education in 19th century American history. It doesn't actually matter much when the poem was written. The poem is hardly even about physical reality. It's about what it's like to have a mind that thinks, or that receives thought. And this experience is hardly different, whether it's taking place during Alaric's sack of Rome or the American Civil War. Not all writers write like this, but the ones who do seem especially inviting, in my view. It's as if they invite you to think with them, as if no time has passed at all. Pascal is, at times at least, such a writer. 
yes, he was born in 1623, and yes, he was Catholic, and yes, he was a child prodigy, educated by his own father, and yes, something called Jansenism was an important theological, political idea during his lifetime, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure there are whole papers about Jansenism and what it is and what it means, but when you read Pascal, it matters little, or it seems to matter little. None of that really matters much when you read his words in his own voice. For example, quote, Imagination decides everything. It creates beauty, justice, and happiness, which is the world's supreme good. Now, does it matter what town he wrote this in, or whether there was war or peace, or whether he advocated for democracy? Does it even matter what the sentence above this and the one below it say? We're dealing here with aphoristic thinking, thought that has come unstuck in time, that is out of place because it is from no particular place. To read this stuff rightly, you have to get in that mindset. Forget the particulars of your life, of your concerns, even of the concerns of the daily news and so on. Fly yourself to the moon if you can. Look at the whole earth from there. <clears throat> Become introspective, esoteric, reflective. The ideal reader for this kind of writing is one who, <clears throat> well, actually, one who can do the thing Rumi talks about in one of his best-known poems. It goes like this. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. I don't even know what century Rumi wrote in, and it doesn't really matter, does it? This is the secret to having the kind of ESP I talked about in my last episode. Become, at least momentarily, unstuck, that's a Kurt Vonnegut phrase, I guess, in time and place. Imagination decides everything. Say it out loud until you understand it. Let, his, let Pascal, let his words become yours. Try them out. See how they feel. Maybe trust him. <clears throat> so for this episode, I think I'm just going to read off some of my favorite bits from Pascal, not in any particular order, and then just sort of think them through in real time to try to get in sync with him. You know, am I time traveling back to the 17th century, or is he time traveling to our century? Was he a prototype version of me, or am I his reincarnation? Let's get blurry, guys. Okay, quote, quote. Let us each examine his thoughts. He will find them wholly concerned with the past or the future. We almost never think of the present, and if we do think of it, it is only to see what light it throws on our plans for the future. The present is never our end. The past and present are our means, the future alone our end. Thus, we never actually live, but hope to live, and since we are always planning how to be happy, it is inevitable that we should never be so. End quote. Ah, oh, man, right? Isn't it true? Even now, like, as I'm doing this in the present, I realize it's, like, not the same present that it will be for you watching it. That'll be another present for me. So it's like, I have to be here now, to quote, you know, Ram Das. I have to let go. To do that, I have to let go of my memory significantly and of my plans for the future and just think about like what it is to be talking into a camera you know thinking about a guy who wrote some stuff in a journal basically 
400 years ago, while I'm sort of staring out across the street at neighbors and like my wife's doing something in the front yard, it's like, it is a weird thing to just think about the present, right? I don't know if it prevents my happiness. I mean, I feel medium happy, you know, content. But maybe he's on to something. Maybe the more you let go of past and present, sorry, past and future, the better your present will feel. It does help me kind of relax my shoulders a little bit and kind of, uh, you know, basically what? Take up good Alexander technique posture or something. Here's another one. Quote. I love this, by the way. Quote. You know how Ag Agat, what's his name? Agad Mat Agad Mator, Agad Mator, the chess guy, has those little quotes above the chess review board when he does those videos. I sent him this one. I think he I think he should use it for like a, an epigraph over one of these chess games from Pascal. Quote: One must have deeper motives and judge everything accordingly, but go on talking like an ordinary person. How great is that, you guys? And it's like a command. One must, one must have deeper motives and judge everything accordingly. But go on talking like an ordinary person. Wow. Like that is really what it is to be, you know, in the world but not of it, right? To keep your one, your your single eye on God, so to speak. But then, you know, to be able to cross the street or like navigate the grocery store aisles or whatever. And that is, that is, that seems true to me and not easy. And it's, uh, it's good insight. It's one I didn't have growing up. I was maybe naively accustomed to just having superficial, you know, unhidden motives and then just talking about them. But here there's like, there's, the argument is that there needs to be deception built into really your moment to moment existence. I don't love it, to be honest. I don't love it, but I, I have a hard time arguing against that view. Here's another one, quote, we know the truth not only through our reason, but also through our heart. Wow. Reason and the heart. I mean, I love thinking about heart. It's one of the oldest metaphors. I think I pointed this out in my episode on the Iliad. The heart is intuitively understood, it seems, although I suppose it must have been taught to people, to me, when I was very, very young. When we say things like memorize it by heart or, I don't know, show some heart or put, you know, put your heart into it or whatever, these things all imply like what sort of the deep down center of our selves or something. Sorry, I'm watching my kid not run out in the street. It's inter there he goes. It's interesting when they're two. They can kind of learn not to go in the street. But then, like, there's this, you can see they like, what would happen if I do, you know? I should like, okay, so here, here's what it says. We know the truth not only through our reason, but also through our heart. I got in this stupid comment argument with a guy the other day um, because I, off the cuff, said that poetry precedes philosophy in my mind. And I mean, I, I don't know, like I support, it's like, it's, it depends a little bit on how you define poetry, right? I mean, poetry, I don't necessarily mean sonnets here, but it's really like what gives rise to sonnets. It's the muses that I'm talking about when I say poetry, right? So it's revelation more than reason. I mean, we can reason about things, but you'll notice that uh, like the guy, I can't even remember who was arguing this point with me, but my guess is that as reasonable as he is, he will have a hard time, you know, just approaching someone cold and like performing reason on them and thereby convincing them to see it his way. 
And that is because that person has heart, right? And they're not just like infinitely persuadable. And sometimes the heart feels in a way that's like lower, deeper than the reasoning brain is able to sort of, or is, is like willing to, you know, seed. It doesn't want to give that ground. The heart really seems to come first sometimes. Sometimes we believe things before we've done the critical analysis and like that's human nature. Like maybe that's okay. That's faith, you know. So we know the truth, not only through our reason, but also through the heart. And of course, also here is like a neutral or an equivalent term. So it's it suggests that there might be that you might have to balance it. It reminds me of like um what do they call that? Like in systems where you've got some redundancy built in and you've got the two, like, aren't there computers that do this now? There's like two processors going at once and it's like they're kind of, they're sort of redundant, but when you put them together and they're firing, they can do like bigger calculations or whatever. Anyway, so that seems to be part of this. Next, quote. I should like to arouse in man the desire to find truth, to be ready, free from passion, to follow it wherever he may find it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Like, that's what I want. I want to, I want to inspire, I want to arouse the desire for truth and the courage to, like, follow it, the, you know, free from passion, he says to follow it wherever you might find it, right? Like, that's the idea. And, of course, it, you have to be free from passion because sometimes when you're following the truth, it leads you into these corridors and you're like, you, you know, you get nervous or you have feelings about it. No, put those feelings aside. If that's where the truth went and you saw its tail disappear down that alleyway, follow it. That's, that's the idea here. Uh, before I read you the next one, Pascal was a theologian and like really quite a genius. I mean, uh, like what, what do I mean by that? I mean, he was like, you can just tell he was the guy who read the original sources. I mean, he's reading the deep stuff. He's read the whole Bible lots of times. And, you know, he sometimes he quotes Montaigne a lot. I'll do another episode on Montaigne here pretty soon. I mean, I, lo I love Montaigne, but Pascal is always kind of negging Montaigne, uh, but like, you know, so he, or like who else, like those, those other guys, I, I can't remember his other contemporaries, but he, cite, he cites them sometimes, but then he'll kind of like effortlessly shift back to talking about, you know, often the Bible, sometimes like Greek or dramas or Tacitus or Juvenal or Su Suetonius, Su Suetonius, Suetonius and so on. And so one of the things that he does, he talks a lot about, first of all, atheism, which was like kind of a new thing, I think, in the 17th century. So if you were looking to do the historical thing, maybe that is relevant there. And then also he talks more than anybody else I've ever read about like the distinctions between Christians and Jews. He does this almost constantly. I would say almost half of the Penn C's is made up of like meditating on Christians and Jews. And, he, and so there's no getting around this. You're going to either have to ban Pascal or like let me quote Pascal talking about this stuff. Now he doesn't do it in a polemical way. He doesn't do it in like overly superficial way. He's, he's thoughtful about this stuff. And so I think it's actually very, it's, it's, this is like, you should read this. Like this is urgent. You know what I mean? This is the kind of thing that I, it's, this is a distinction that has largely been lost, at least on Christians in the 20th century. And if they read Pascal, they will be confronted with what for a lot of Christians would be the uncomfortable realization that like historically, this was a, there was real tension between these different groups of people. And like the, the, the idea or like the phrase Judeo-Christianity simply would have made no sense to Pascal in like, in a, in a visceral, authentic way, he would have been like, what the heck is that, okay? But first, before we get to that stuff, just what he says about atheists and uh, so on, he says, quote, pity the atheists who seek, 
for they, sorry, start over. Pity the atheists who seek, for are they not unhappy enough? Inveigh against those who boast about it. So, you know, to pity, obviously, is to sort of almost weep for. And, like, that's the right attitude to have when you encounter these atheists who are genuinely seeking. Like, they want to believe. They wish there was a God. They want to live forever or be united with the divine or whatever. It's just that they have, like, kind of a hard time believing it, right? That was me. Through my whole 20s, I was exactly one of these. You don't meet them very often. They don't write books the way that the new atheists do, right? It's like the the new atheists are moronically sure that there isn't a God, it seems to me sometimes. But like, no, this isn't who we're talking about. There are occasional atheists who want to believe but just don't feel it. They don't get it. Their heart's not clicking. Pity them. <clears throat> but in they... That is, you know, release invective, like basically, I mean, it's not quite hateful, but like, you know, shame those who boast about it. <clears throat> yeah, good. Okay, the next one says, this is quote, two errors. One, to take everything literally. Two, to take everything spiritually. Those, that's interesting, isn't it? The Scylla and Charybdis here, the rock and the hard place, the two errors. To take everything literally, which I would oppose by saying to take everything metaphorically or symbolically, but instead there he says spiritually, which does imply, and I think it's true for him, that like for him, spirituality, religion, the essence of this stuff, it is, it requires interpretation. It's like, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it involves meaning making, right? Like this is the kind of thing where if you're a total moron, start with Jordan Peterson and sort of work your way up. That's what we're talking about here. But but eventually, you know, the golden mean, right? Like find your way into the middle. Some things are literal. I mean, it's like I saw that video Paul Talk was talking the other day and he's right. Like nature is suffused with lessons, I forget what he said exactly, but like he pointed out the branch on some tree or something. I see this all the time, probably over much, because, you know, this is part of my, like, literary interest, is to think about, you know, Emerson, oh, like, well, Swedenborgianism, right? Emersonian, uh, as above, so belowism, the kind of, the thing where you think about the meaning of things. Like, Total halfwits don't do this ever. For them, the world is just material. Then you become an Emersonian, and now, and like now, an Emersonian, and now like <clears throat> nature, things, experiences become signifiers. They become like hieroglyphs, as Emerson would say, right? But you can probably take that too far. You can end up schizophrenic. Like you can go full Captain Ahab, where now just everything you look at takes on meaning you know the crepe myrtle outside like yeah i mean maybe there are some like lessons about nature's dynamism if i look at it but it's also sort of it is just a crepe myrtle tree in winter there's not that much to to make of it sometimes so be in the middle on that <clears throat> okay let's do some of this uh christian and jew stuff because it's really interesting and these are quotes youtube algorithm right i'm just quoting from pascal here quote Carnal Jews are midway between Christians and heathen. The heathen do not know God and love only earthly things. The Jews know the true God and love only earthly things. Christians know the true God and do not love earthly things. Jews and heathen love the same goods. Jews and Christians Know the same God. <clears throat> Man, that's saying a lot, isn't it? You might have to rewind that one and play it back. But it's a really interesting observation. The idea is that like the God for Christians and Jews is the same, but that Christians throw in all their chips with that God. That's like that's what they live for. <clears throat> Whereas Jews somehow, and this does this perplexes me. This is 
this to me seems anti-logos. They know the God, but they are concerned with the things of the world, earthly things, Pascal says. I mean, I don't really understand that. For me, it's like, if there's a God, if he loves you, if you can be with him eternally, it's like, that's your chief concern. Whereas, like, you know, paychecks, fertilizing the lawn, getting your oil changed, these things, you got to do them, but they're not your chief concern, you know? <clears throat> and so, like, the people who have a chief concern in that, they may or may not know God. But, you know, it's basically if they know God, they're the Jews, and if they don't, they are the heathen, Pascal says. Interesting. Another one, quote, I love this. This actually is just about mind stuff, I suppose. Quote, the infinite distance between mind and body symbolizes the infinitely more infinite distance between mind and charity. For charity is supernatural. Wow. Whoa, that is amazing, isn't it? First of all, so you've got a, an analogy happening here. Th th there's an infinite distance between mind and body, but that only symbolizes an even greater infinity between mind and charity. Charity, which is, of course, like the type of love indicated in that famous verse from Corinthians, right? Love, charity is patient. Love is patient. Love is kind. That's what we're talking about here, charity in that sense. So what does it mean to say charity is supernatural? I've thought about this some. It really is kind of supernatural. Like charity is something in the animal kingdom, in nature, that doesn't really make sense. Like charity, where you give of yourself, where like you give up your own well-being for another's is something, I'm sure you could find examples that look like that, kind of, in the animal kingdom, but it's not the kind of thing that Pascal means. You kind of know what, you kind of know what I mean. I mean, real charity, like if you have kids, chances are you've begun to understand what it is to, like, do charity. It's something that, like, I don't know, maybe saints, some, some saints can do it for strangers, but it's, it's hard for me, like, because I have, like, limited resources and energy. And, uh, and, and three kids, like I'm, I'm basically charitied out by the end of the day. It takes all my like higher self to just like, you know, when my kids will go look at this thing I did and it's, you know, you, sometimes you've seen the same drawing 15 times, but you want to go, Hey, that's pretty good. I noticed you did this there. You try to be specific. You make eye contact with them. You say, I love you kid. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's an act of charity because it would be easier for me to be like, shush, get out of here. And so, yeah, I think this is, I think he's right that ultimately, like, where does it come from? It comes from God. Like that, there's no, there's no natural explanation for this kind of stuff. Here's another quote. And this one comes from a section titled, quote, to show that true Jews and true Christians have only one religion. End quote. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, actually. It's really an interesting idea. It's kind of the perennialist idea. It's not popular right now because it isn't particularly like politically useful, I guess, or something like that. But it's probably my wheelhouse. Like this is where I feel most comfortable in some sense to say. So this is what he says. Here's the quote. Quote, the true Jews considered their merit to come only from God and not from Abraham, end quote. And what does he mean there? Well, he spends a lot of time on that page, if I remember right, talking about, you know, how in John 8, they say, we're Abraham's children, and putting their trust basically in the body, in their, you know, the, the lineage, the genetic lineage of their identity. And what Pascal says is like, no, that is not the essence even of Judaism. This is what I said the other day on one of those streams. And I, I believe this, like the original, what we now call Judaism would have been something closer to what Christianity is supposed to be, 
often isn't because Christians will get the same kind of credentialism going where they're like, you know, basically, uh, like, I'm a Methodist and so therefore I'm saved or something. Same, same thing. Like, no, 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 that's not it, right? We live because God lets us live. Like, that's, that's the argument here. Quote. Here's another quote. I love this one, too. Does anybody else have, like, I mean, this is my life. The history of my life can be summed up here. I make weirdo friends. I hope that I have weirdo kids. I think in a good way, I married a weirdo wife. Like, my parents are weird. I love weird people. This one says, quote, The more intelligent one is, the more men of originality one finds. Ordinary people find no difference between men. End quote. My first friend was a weirdo. My second friend was a weirdo. Like, these are really weird guys. My third, my third and fourth friends were just sort of jock guys I met in sports in high school. But like, okay. My fifth friend was a weirdo. My sixth friend was a weirdo. My seventh friend was a weirdo. Like, this is who I like to hang out with. Another one, quote, <clears throat> The history of the church should properly be called the history of truth. And I read that one just to give you a sense of how Christian Pascal is. He really goes all in. He's a Catholic, although, you know, a sort of post-Renaissance Catholic. So there's a certain amount of, like, humanism built into that or something like that. But, but the guy is a Christian, okay? That's important here. Then only two more quotes, and then I'm almost done with Pascal. <clears throat> Quote, the church has three kinds of enemies. The Jews, who have never been part of its body. The heretics, who have withdrawn from it. And bad Christians, who rend it from within. Man, that's an interesting list, isn't it? The enemies, the enemies of the church. These days, it seems the church is, like, not supposed to have enemies. I mean, the church just loves everybody. It's embarrassing, the degree to which the church has forgotten what it's like to have enemies. But here's a list. The Jews, the heretics, and the bad Christians. And in my view, the church would be well advised to remember that list and, and think about it and think about what Pascal means with that. Now, yes, yes. What do we do? We're Christians. We pray for our enemies. That's true. This isn't a declaration of like military war or anything. But it's to note that there are people who would pull apart the church at its seams, who would get rid of it altogether, who would subvert it, who would undo it, who would uh, turn it upside down, make a mockery of it, right? That's what Pascal sees when he sees the Jews, the heretics, and the bad Christians. Anyway, wake up to it. And then I thought I would finish with one. Remember, Pascal's a Christian. And really a smart one. And a good writer. And, like, one of these guys that, I mean, there is this kind of middle period between, you know, the classics and then, like, basically the post-revolutionary stuff where you get the novels and the kind of continental philosophy and all that. So, I mean, I think he was writing in the middle of the 1600s, basically. So it's like, what, he's not really medieval, but he's also not modern in the you know post-French Revolution sense. So he's sort of right in the middle there. One of the things he says, I've always, I mean, this one might be a stumbling block for some people. Very short aphorism here. He says, quote, quote, either Jews or Christians must be wicked. And that, my friends, is something to think about. Why would he say that? He doesn't clarify. That is an aphorism all of its own. It, it gets a whole section. It's a single sentence paragraph, rare, even in Pascal. I mean, he, 
he he goes super pithy on that one. But I think if you take the time, I mean, these are so good. They, this is a great translation, the Penguin Edition, cheap, you know, eight bucks or whatever. You can read it. It's it's easy to read. These aren't even full chapters. You know what I mean? It's like these are little aphorisms, little maxims, little sayings that you can go, just keep it by your bedside. I strongly recommend it, especially if you're a Christian. His understanding of kind of like what Christianity is, what it did, what it accomplished, how it changed human civilization is profound. Like you are missing out. If you haven't read Pascal and you're like weighing in on, especially if you're like weighing in on Christianity and Judaism and you haven't read Pascal, yo, like what are you doing? You know what I mean? I mean, if Ben Shapiro wants to come on my show and we can talk about some of these, you know, maxims from Pascal, I would be interested in that because my hunch is that it would kind of confound him. It's like, where's the, where's the Judeo in this Christianity? It seems to be adversarial at times, although never hateful. This, it's never, you know, he, he's not calling for uh, like any sort of violence or anything here. In fact, he almost sympathizes. He almost feels bad, I guess is the word. Pities would probably be the right word for it. To be like, you know, these people who, and he, and it's not all, right? He goes, some of them embraced the truth. Some of them followed the Christ. Some of them have become Christians. But the ones who didn't basically are out in the cold like forever now. I mean, their city got destroyed. They've been wandering around. They're never comfortable anymore. You know, so this is for Pascal. This is sort of evidence that God, you know, was in the Christ and that was, that was Jesus. Really good reading. <clears throat> Strongly recommend. I think I will. I'm still, I'll either do Herodotus next or Montaigne next, but uh, those will probably be the next two episodes. And I probably won't get to all of Herodotus. I'll just maybe do the first half and then circle back as uh, Jen Pasaki says all the time in a couple of episodes. Hey, um, you're listening to the outro music now. Thanks for stopping by again. Uh, remember, <clears throat> we have a secret stream tomorrow night, Friday night at 9 p.m., and we can talk about sort of whatever's going on in your imaginations. I'm hoping to get some new participants this time, virgin voices on the show. See you next time. Check the link for the Patreon page in the description.